Hello everyone and welcome back. This is the last video where we'll be going through the final five problems of the senior mock paper. If you haven't looked at it yet, you can find it in the description below. And for all of you who have looked at it, you may find that these last five questions are the most unusual set. Um, and that's usually the case for the SMO senior because this is where they put in all the combinatorics and number theory questions, which isn't so common in our regular math classes. So for those of you who are newer to Math Olympiads, you may find that these are the most difficult ones because the ideas are not as familiar as maybe the earlier 15 problems. All right, so let's get started with question 21. Let m and n be positive integers such that 2 to the m equals to n factorial plus 8. Find the sum of all possible values of m. Just a quick tip, for many of these questions, there won't be that many solutions. The intuition is that factorials are really far apart and powers of 2 are also really far apart. Now the chance that they just happen to coincide is really small. So it's not that surprising that after a while it should diverge away and there are no more solutions. So one way that we can do it is just to list out the first few factorials plus 8 and see which ones work. So just write a table of the first few values of n. And the first few factorials are quite easy to calculate. I'll just write it up to 7. So 1, 2, 6, 24, 120, 720, and 5040. Remember, it's just times 5, times 6, times 7, and so on. And we can write down what's the value after adding 8. Maybe I'll write one more. Now, we want to see which of these are powers of 2. And 32 is 2 to the power of 5. So that's 1. And actually, 1 to 8 is also a power of 2. It is 2 to the power of 7. But as it turns out, the rest of these are not powers of 2. It is quite obvious that 9, 10, and 14 are not powers of 2. But perhaps you may be wondering, without calculating all the powers of 2, how do I know that everything to come after, like 7, 2, 8, 5, 0, 4, 8, how do I know whether or not they are powers of 2? And the answer to that question lies in the meaning of power of 2. A power of 2 can only have one prime factor which is 2. In other words, if you keep on trying to divide by 2, it should eventually reach 1 because there is no other factor available. Now let's say that you try taking 7 to 8. 7 to 8, you can factor out 8, but it becomes 8 times 91. If you try to factor this one, you would get 8 times 631. And if you factor out here again, it will be 8 times 5041. Now the reason for this is actually quite simple. You're adding 8 down here, and the n factorial is a multiple of 8 for everything beyond this point. However, if we look at 720, 5040, and 40320, and so on, these are divisible by 16. Because there's 2 from the 2, and then there's 2 squared from 4, and then there's another 2 from the 6. So you already get 2, 2 squared and 2. So you have 2 to the power of 4 in all of these. But when you add 8, it is no longer a multiple of 16 because if you take a multiple of 16 plus 8, it's not a multiple of 16. So it is a multiple of 8 but not 16. And so it cannot be a power of 2 because all of these numbers, if they are not a multiple of 16 and a power of 2, that doesn't make sense. You are telling me that all of them has to be at most 8, which is ridiculous. 
So therefore, all of these do not work and the only two values that work are m equals to 5 and 7. So your answer is 5 plus 7, which is equal to 12. Question 22. Determine the number of ordered triples ABC such that ABC are distinct factors of 4,000 and any two of ABC share a common factor greater than 1. Now let's think about this for a second. What kind of factors of 4,000 are there? And how do I make sure that any two of them share a common factor? Well, the first thing to do is to factor 4,000. That's not very difficult to do because 4,000 is just 4 times 1,000 and 1,000 is 10 cubed. 10 is 2 times 5 and 4 is 2 squared. So this is 2 to the power of 5 times 5 cubed. So all of your factors, again, only contain 2 or 5. Clearly, none of the a, b, c are going to be 1. Right? If any of them are 1, then the common factor of anything else is 1. So that will not be the way to make an ordered triple satisfying this condition. Instead, we have to make sure that we at least have a 2 or a 5. So let's split it up according to three different types. So the first type is just 2 to the power of something. And that 2 to the power of something can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you have 5 types. The second would be if it is 5 to the power of something, and that can be 5 to the power of 1, 2, or 3. And so there are 3 types. And the third type is if you have both. 2 to the power of something times 5 to the power of something. And once again, the first can be 1 to 5, the second can be 1 to 3, so you have 15 of this type 3. Now, the key observation is that you cannot pick from both type 1 and type 2. Because if you pick one from type 1 and one from type 2, they would have a common factor of 1. So you cannot have both types. Now, so if we cannot have both types, then what can we have is the remaining question. And the answer is, well, either I exclude type 1 or I exclude type 2. So if I only take 2 and 3, so type 2 and type 3, there are 18 numbers. So my number of choices is just 18 times 17 times 16. If I only take type 1 and 3, then there are 20 numbers, so my number of choices is 20 times 19 times 18. Remember, they are distinct, so that's why we cannot repeat ourselves. Now, finally, we have overcounted those that only come from type 3, because when we did 2 and 3, it's possible that all 3 came from type 3. If we do 1 and 3, it's also possible that all 3 come from type 3. So 3 only will have been counted twice, which is 15 times 14 times 13. So here you have to do a little bit of calculation. You add the first two and you subtract the third. So do this very carefully because you know this is the answer already. So it will be a huge waste at this point to make a CD calculation error when you've done all the clever steps. I'm just going to give the final result which should be 9006. So there are some slight variations you can do in how you do the counting, but all of them involve not picking from both types 1 and type 2. Okay, question 23. I think this is probably the most difficult of them in a way 
but the idea is pretty nice and I wanted to share this idea. Now the first hint is that x, y, z are all between minus 1 and 1. Perhaps this doesn't seem very informative to you, but it is quite important. Now, another thing is that this is really symmetric looking. So you probably don't want to do a bunch of substitutions and create a massive equation where you're supposed to solve for x. At least not just yet. Or do we? Now, because we are asked for the product of solutions, we know from Vieta's formulas that we don't really need the whole thing. We just need the first and the last coefficient. So the substitution may not be as bad as it looks. So I can put in y into here. Now, this first one is still okay. You get 8z to the 4 minus 8z squared plus 1. Now, you can then also substitute it into the third equation. Sorry, I realized that I have not quite I've drawn the correct arrow. I meant I can substitute the third equation into here. I can put z equals 2x squared minus 1 into here. And I only care about the first and last coefficient. So this would be 1, 2, 8, x to the 8 bunch of stuff and then you get 8 minus 8 plus y. Um, and I can move the x over, it just falls somewhere into this huge um, dot 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 bunch of terms, so you get this. Now at this point, we can say that the product of roots by Vietas is 1 over 1 to 8. Now, if the product of roots is 1 over 1 to 8, then is the answer 1 to 8? Well, it certainly looks like it. But there could be some issues. Well, what are the issues? Firstly, how do we know that all these values are actually real numbers? Second of all, how do we know that they even are between negative 1 and 1? And third of all, how do we know that they don't repeat? So if we ask for the product of all possible values of x, it may be 1 over 1 to 8, or it may not be. Well, as it turns out, spoiler alert, this is the correct answer. But I can also explain why they really are different. Now, the reason why we know that they are different and between negative 1 and 1 is that we can do a very clever substitution using none other than the cosine double angle identity. I'll let x equals to cosine alpha. I can do this because if x is between negative 1 and 1, then certainly this is a valid substitution. Right? I don't have to worry about, oh, if x is actually 3, then something's going to go wrong. So I will then put the substitution into here, and you get z equals to 2 cosine squared a minus 1, so alpha minus 1 which is cosine 2 alpha. If you substitute into the middle equation, you get y equals to 2 cosine squared 2 alpha minus 1, which is cosine 4 alpha. And if you put that back into the first equation, 
you get x is now equal to cosine 8 alpha. Well, so this means that in order for all of this to work, the requirement is that cosine alpha and cosine 8 alpha are the same. If these are the same, then we win. Because if they are the same, then y and z just need to follow cosine 2 alpha and cosine 4 alpha, and we are saying that all of these will work out nicely when you substitute back in one loop. Now, I want to make sure that there are really 8 solutions in this way, where x equals to cosine alpha, so that I know that all the 8 roots really are going to be counted to it. Then the answer would be 1 to 8. So let's try to equate these. I'll subtract it over and use none other than the sum to product formulas for cosines. Now, you would get negative 2 sine 4.5 alpha sine 3.5 alpha. So for these to be 0, we can write down all the different possible values of alpha. It means that 4.5 alpha is a multiple of pi or 3.5 alpha is a multiple of pi. And if you check these, 4.5 alpha is a multiple of pi, you would get 0 and then 2 pi over 9. 2, pi, 2 over 9 is 1 over 4.5, so I'm just simplifying that. All the way to 8 pi over 9. And similarly here, you would get 2 pi over 7 to 6 pi over 7. Now note that I stopped here because if we go beyond 6 pi over 7, like 8 pi over 7, 10 pi over 7, um, those are just going to give you the same cosine value. So it's not a different root. Now here this gives you exactly 8 roots already. And in this 8 roots, one of them is rejected, but cosine 0 is 1. So cosine 0 is 1, it's not a problem. Technically, 1, 1, 1 would be a solution to this. We have to throw that out. But throwing it out doesn't affect the product because multiplying by 1 or not multiplying by 1 is irrelevant. And so because of that, we know that there are 8 solutions and the product of these cosines is 1 over 1 to 8. Excluding this one, the product of those cosines is still 1 over 1 to 8. And so therefore, your correct answer is 1 to 8 indeed. Now, the part on the right is more of an explanation of how do we know. However, in the context of an SMO, it is pretty acceptable to just make the guess on the left. If you're not so sure why, or in fact you don't see anything wrong with it, I think you can get away with it for this question. But the substitution is pretty nice, and such trigonometric substitutions do help us to solve quite a lot of problems. So I think it is worth mentioning here. On to question 24, which is my attempt to set a counting question where you can't actually start listing out triangles, as is the want of many students. That is not going to go very well here, because there are so many lines. Specifically, 9 lines from A to side BC and 6 lines from B to side AC. Well, certainly you cannot just count manually. Well, one interesting feature of the way I have constructed this is that all the lines do intersect each other. And maybe that sounds a little unfortunate, because if all the lines intersect each other, that means that you have a lot of triangles, right? You don't have like far away parallel lines that don't intersect. All of them intersect one another. But what that means is that I can start off grabbing most of the triangles, in fact, all the triangles, just by saying there are nine here, six here, and three sides. So altogether, 9 plus 6 plus 3 is 18. So there are 18 lines going on in this figure here. 
and in this figure with 18 lines, I'm just going to pick any three of them. So 18 choose 3 is equal to 18 times 17 times 16 over 3 factorial. This is not the answer, but this is quite close to being the answer. The reason why this is quite close to being the answer is that most of the time, if you pick three lines, let's say you just pick a line here, a line here, and a line here, you realize that you have already formed a triangle. Because all the lines intersect, if you pick any three lines, it will form a triangle unless all of them intersect at the same point. Meaning that you pick three lines that intersect at A or three lines that intersect at B. So what you need to do is to subtract off precisely that. Nine lines are coming out from A, excluding the two sides. So 11 lines are coming out of A, and so you need to subtract off 11 through 3. Six lines are coming out of B, excluding the two sides. So eight lines are coming out of B, and you need to subtract off 8 through 3. In doing so, you have subtracted off all the instances where three lines are all coming from the same place. Something like this would be now removed and you'd be left with actual triangles. So carefully calculate this and you would find there are 595 triangles, which is absolutely impossible to count. But pretty straightforward if you found this counting approach. Now, this is quite a common rule of thumb for any counting question. If it looks like it can be listed out in 5 minutes or so, by all means go and list it out. But if it looks like it is pretty impossible to list out manually within 5 minutes, there should be a clever method. Because the question setters are not intending for you to waste half an hour on one question. So there must be a much simpler way. And if you can find that much simpler way, it may even take just 2 minutes or something much less than the more standard algebra problems. And on that note, we are on our final question 25. What is the largest possible remainder when n is divided by 900 and n is a rearrangement of m? m being 20, 22 factorial, which we are only given uh, some of the digits. The first thing to say here is that 900 can be written as 9 times 100, which does not sound very clever when I say it out loud. Why I care about 9 though is that after rearranging, it will still be divisible by 9 because 2022 factorial is obviously divisible by 9, one of its factors is 9. So you know that 9 is a factor of n. We want the largest possible remainder when divided by 900. So when divided by 900, the remainder must be a multiple of 9. So the largest potential remainder would be 900 minus 9, which is 891. It has to be a multiple of 9, right? You can't have a remainder, let's say, of 899. Because if it's a remainder of 899, you're telling me that n is not a multiple of 9, which we have already seen is a requirement. Same thing. Now, can we really make it 891? Well, to make it 891, I need the last two digits to be 91. So I need it to be something, 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 91. The question is, can that happen? And the answer is yes. And you can see why some digits are now included. Because the question is helpfully telling you that there is a digit 9 and 1 somewhere in 2022 factorial. Now, to be honest, I was deliberating as the question setter whether I even need to mention this because 2022 factorial is so long. How can it possibly not contain a 9 and a 1? Uh, but technically speaking, that's not valid as a proof. Uh, just because it should happen doesn't mean it will happen. So I just decided 
um, to include that portion so that we are absolutely certain that 9 and 1 are really part of the number. And thus, 891 is attainable and it must be the largest remainder. And that's it. This is the last question of the mock paper. Hope you found the questions interesting. Uh, for those of you who are taking the SMO Senior, I uh, hope you have also seen some new ideas as well as a refresher of some very familiar ideas that are often being tested in the SMO. And if you have any feedback or comments on the paper, please leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe and do look out for the review of the open paper which is coming up next in a few days time. So thanks everyone for watching and see you again soon.